When I was little, my dad told me about the stars. We had music at home, and it was pure magic. I became a scientist and a musician. I was curious about how things work, scientifically and artistically, and I ended up on a long journey toward understanding ourselves, the human species. I think that a deeper understanding of how things work and of how we work can give us hope for the future. What do I mean by a deeper understanding? And what is this thing we call understanding? Well, it's all bound up with the way perception works. Indeed, we often use the words perception and understanding to mean almost the same thing. If I perceive a charging rhinoceros coming at me, then I understand. I instinctively understand that if I don't jump out of the way, I might come to a sorry end. The way perception works is kind of important. It's been central to survival for hundreds of millions of years. And for us today, it's central to the arts and it's central to the sciences. It's central to thinking skills and to communication skills of any kind, scientific, artistic, and personal. It's central to how music works. So it's going to be central to this talk. And perception is such a very instinctive process. Straight away, I'm in trouble because of all the quarrels about the word instinct and what it should mean. Part of the trouble comes from the old idea, it's a false dichotomy, the idea of nature versus nurture or instinct versus learning as if they were two separate and independent things. Here's an example to show why that's a misconception. Look at those 12 moving dots. Everyone with normal vision sees a person walking. I hope you'd agree that seeing the person walking is instinctive. We can't help seeing a person walking even though it's only 12 moving dots. So here's the point. This instinct involves not only genetic memory, but also learning. The learning part tends to be overlooked because it's unconscious. It goes back to the infantile groping that calibrates the visual system. The evidence is clear. There's direct evidence from neuroscience. And there are famous cases of children born blind with congenital cataracts. Such children fail to develop normal vision unless the cataracts are removed early enough. So my point is that nurture is intimately part of nature. To develop normal vision, we need the DNA, and hence the DNA, RNA protein circuits that prepare us for unconscious learning. And then we need the learning itself, which reacts back on the circuits. The DNA, RNA protein circuits behave like self-assembling building blocks that assemble themselves in ways that depend on DNA and environment in an intimate interplay. And by the way, language is another example. Language has its self-assembling building blocks. Self-assembling building blocks are part of the great story of biological evolution. And evolution works in a far more subtle and complex way than you might think from the usual popular accounts. The demonstration illustrates several important things about how perception works. One of them is basic. We make unconscious assumptions. Here, we unconsciously assume a particular kind of three-dimensional motion. Another thing it illustrates is the organic change principle, as I like to call it. It says that we're perceptually sensitive to patterns that change organically, meaning simply that some parts change continuously, or by small amounts, while others stay the same. The walking lights is an example, OK? The things that stay the same, I'll call them the invariant elements. They include the number of dots, always 12 dots, and the number of limbs, always two arms and two legs, and the invariant distances between the dots in our three-dimensional perception of a person walking. And there are zillions more examples. A charging rhinoceros presents us with an organically changing pattern. So does a cat stalking a bird. Sensitivity to organic change is important for survival. It's central to our ability to distinguish living things from dead things. It's a matter of life and death. It's no accident that artists know about organic change, at least unconsciously, and that they talk about bringing something to life such as a poem or a musical score. 
Now, I want to talk about music for a moment because the organic change principle says a lot about how music works its magic. One example is harmony in Western music, chord progressions, if you will, to see how they work. All you need is the organic change principle, the perceptual sensitivity to patterns in which some things stay the same and others change by small amounts. But here's the interesting thing. With pairs of musical notes, there are two kinds of smallness or closeness. So it's like the hyperspace of science fiction stories. You can go somewhere that's both nearby and far away. And what are the two kinds of smallness or closeness? Well, next door on the fingerboard or keyboard, da -de, the next closest is da -de, and so on. The second kind of smallness or closeness begins with the octave, da -de. Those two notes are so close in the second sense that musicians even give them the same name. And the next closest in the second sense is da -de. Musicians call it the perfect fifth, and da -de, perfect fourth, and so on. You can say most of what's in the books on hum musical harmony in just one or two sentences. Powerfully moving chord progressions are organically changing patterns in which the invariant elements are usually one or two notes staying the same, while other notes change by amounts that are small in either of the two possible senses. The invariant element can also be a chord shape, so then all the notes can move in parallel. <coughs> now, the way music works is relevant to communication skills. For instance, if you want to be lucid or make yourself logically clear and easily understood in writing or speaking, you shouldn't be afraid of repetition. Repeated words or phrases can be the invariant elements in organically changing word patterns. What then is this thing we call understanding and how can we best cultivate it? Well, I think part of the answer is to cultivate lucidity in our thinking as well as in our writing and speaking because thinking, writing and speaking can all help each other when we try to understand something. And another part of the answer, which I found hugely important in my own scientific research work, it's what the great physicist Max Born called the loosening of thinking that gives us an escape route from mindsets, unconscious assumptions again. They can be wrong. That's another part of how perception works. Those dots might be 12 lanterns carried around by 12 people. When Max Born talked about loosening of thinking, he meant avoiding the idea that there's only one answer to a problem and only one way to view a problem. Such loosening or mental flexibility is important for a deeper understanding of practically anything, not just in science, but also in the arts and in human problems generally. For instance, the teachings of the Buddha recognize the value of seeing human problems in more than one way. And with scientific problems, and my own work on jet streams and the Antarctic ozone hole illustrates this, it's useful to look at a problem from several different angles, several different viewpoints. For instance, using words, pictures, feelings, and mathematical equations. If I reach a stage where these different viewpoints all make sense and agree with each other wherever they overlap, then I've reached what I'd call a deeper understanding. So now I come back to biological evolution. That's even more complex than the Antarctic ozone hole, which heaven knows is complex enough. And yet, despite the complexity, evolution, the way it works, has been greatly clarified in recent years, something I find very exciting, not least because it gives us insight into our own human nature and the problems we face. And it's another good illustration of the value of viewing a problem from more than one angle as an escape route from mindsets. One form of mindset that can impede progress in science, and I'm quoting from a wonderful book by Christopher Wills that isn't well known. It's called The Runaway Brain. Christopher Wills shows how researchers can become prisoners of their mathematical models. This seems to have been one of the difficulties with, for example, selfish gene theory. Selfish gene theory is partly right. It gets us part of the way towards understanding evolution. And some versions of it do recognize that genetic memory, DNA, provides 
self-assembling building blocks and not rigid blueprints or hard wiring. But then the theory impedes progress by sticking to mathematical models that are far too simple, or some versions forbid us to view the problem from any other angle. Only the simplified mathematical models are allowed, and only the genes I view is allowed. All other viewpoints are wrong, we're told. We're even told that that's mathematically proven, and there's an accompanying mindset that evolution and natural selection function only at the level of individual selfishness. Again, that's partly right, but far too simple, indeed simplistic. Real natural selection is immensely more subtle and complex. That's clear now from many different lines of evidence, also from mathematical models that are becoming much more sophisticated. Especially for social species like ours, it's very clear, despite lingering conflict, between some biologists. It's clear that natural selection acts not only at the level of individuals but also at higher levels such as the level of social groups as well as lower levels all the way down to the molecular level. These days it's called multi-level selection and it's consistent with the many lines of evidence and with the recent mathematical models and that in turn removes many of the old biological puzzles and oversimplifications about so-called human nature. Our DNA does give us the self-assembling building blocks for selfishness and aggression, greed and genocide, but also in equal measure for generosity, love and altruism even to strangers. By altruism I mean actual behaviour, not pious sentiments. How the building blocks assemble themselves is under cultural as well as genetic influence, most of it unconscious. Now I dared to mention hope for the future. Will greed and genocide win? Compassion and cooperation? What about the Earth's life support system? What about civilization? Well, it hardly needs saying that some of the greatest threats to civilization come from this thing we call fundamentalism in all its various forms. These include atheistic forms as well as theistic or religious forms. I'd suggest that the atheistic fundamentalisms pose some of the greatest dangers. What is fundamentalism? Well, I'd say its most basic characteristic is just the mindset that Max Born wanted us to avoid. The mindset that only one viewpoint is allowed and that that one viewpoint gives us the answer, the truth, if you will, and that all other viewpoints are wrong. So my hope for the future is that Max Born's loosening of thinking will help us avoid at least some of the damaging conflicts in which one fundamentalism is pitted against another. Take science and religion, and by the way, I'm not myself conventionally religious, but that's beside the point. I don't think that the conflict between science and religion, quote unquote, I don't think it's about religious insight versus scientific insight, I think it's more about religious fundamentalism versus scientific fundamentalism. Scientific fundamentalism says that science is the answer to everything and that no other viewpoint is allowed. Well, not only Max Born, but also the arts, I think, can help us to avoid such conflicts. And so can the best science with its openness and its open-mindedness, its awareness, not only of its immense power, but also of its limitations. Progress in any human endeavour usually comes from young people. I see many young faces here. You have the gifts of intense curiosity and open-mindedness. You want to understand how things work. You can help dispel mindsets. You can work on your communication skills. You can help to solve the enormous problems that confront us. So go for it. Thank you.